Good morning. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you know, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Yeah. Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and say, I am so happy you're here. I'm so happy. <laughs> we're, we're happy to have you here at Broadus, uh, whether you're here or, or in your car or you're tuning in through Facebook Live from uh, Bedside Baptist Church, where we're happy you're here with us this morning. And we have a few announcements if you'll open up in the bulletin. Uh, just on the inside right page. Uh, today we're going to have Converge, which is our youth fellowship gathering of all the, um, all the campuses and different ministries that we have. So we can all come here, have fun, and play outside and play games and stuff. Uh, as it looks like it's going to be a nice sunny day. Also, uh, the Easter missions offering is still collecting. Uh, just so y'all are aware. But other than that, there's um, different announcements throughout your bulletin. And if you will, just find a place where you can plug into our church. But let's prepare our hearts for worship. Dear Father, we thank you for this time, God. We thank you for this time where we can slow down, where we can relax, and we can focus on you. God, would you rid us of, of all distractions? Just help us focus on you and, and tune our hearts to your grace, God, as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'd like to invite you at this time to stand as we sing, There is Power in the Blood. Like a wildfire in my heart Sunday morning, hallelujah And it's lasting all week long Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song Oh, won't you choose it? You can't lose it There ain't nothing, there ain't I'm gonna steal my joy I've got a notion Why it's singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation And it's beautiful I've got a heart overflowing Cause I've been restored There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't 
turned a mountain I can't climb. Oh, you are with me, never leave me. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got to know why you're saying in my soul. I've got to speak salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been Singing in my soul, I've got a sweet salvation, and it's beautiful. I've got a note, why you sing in my soul? I've got a sweet salvation, and it's beautiful. I've got a heart on the floor, cause I've been restored. Yeah. Right, you got your blood, blood pumping a little bit this morning. I want to invite any children here this morning to come on up with me. We've got some eggs here. Your, your eggs? Your, your eggs. Okay, I'm gonna put these eggs over here. Thank you. That wasn't part of the children's message. I... All right, good to see you guys. Why don't you come on? I was gonna put carpet squares around, but I think y'all can kind of spread out a little bit. You can sit with your sister or brother there. You guys come on down. You can even sit on the, on the floor if you want. I tell you what, I'll move these. And I'm going to ask, this is John Mason, and he's going to come up to this microphone here, and he's going to read a Bible passage this morning, and it has to do with children. Okay, so I want you to listen to it. So, John Mason, if you do that for us. And you can pull your mask down when you're reading there you go. Hello. So I'm going to be reading Mark chapter 10, 13 through 16. People were bringing the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on them and blessed them. All right, thank you. That is a really neat story about Jesus during his, his ministry where people were coming. They wanted to hear him you know, preach and, and teach and stuff like that. Well, one day, I guess some moms and dads said to their kids, oh, let's, go, let's go meet Jesus. I hear he's so nice and he teaches such wonderful things that we need to know. And so they, they went to see him. And when they got close, all these kids started coming up towards Jesus. And you know what the disciples did? Did you hear what they did? They told him to stop. They said, oh, y'all shouldn't be up here with Jesus. You know, he talks to adults, I guess. And, and told him to go away. Well... That passage said Jesus was indignant. You know what that means? He was, he was a little bit angry. I mean, he, he could not believe that his disciples were telling the children to go away. And so uh, he kind of said, what are you doing? Bring them up to me. And so he brought the, the children up to him. And, and it basically says Jesus gave them hugs. You, you know, and, 
And then he, he uh, blessed them, which means he just said wonderful things to them that you know, made him feel good and helped them to know that God, God loved them. So it's one of the stories that tells us how much God loves people of any age, whether you're one year old or two or seven or, or 99. You, you know, he, he just loves people of, of every age. And, uh, but imagine how you would have felt this morning if, if I had gotten up and said, Oh, you know, children, y'all come on up here with, with me. And so y'all came out in the aisle to come forward. And then old Mr. Buddy over here, maybe Mr. George back there, they hopped up in the aisle and they said, not you. You sit back down. How would that have made you feel? Yeah, pretty bad, you know. Well, that's kind of what the disciples were doing. But I am so glad that Jesus helps us to know how welcome we are uh, to know him and to, and to love him, and then to be a part of his family. That when we trust him, uh, he invites us to be what the Bible calls part of the kingdom of God, that we can be uh, in, the, in the family of God. So, um, you know, there are some places that you can go that we have a big word, we call it exclusive, meaning they just don't let just anybody there. So if you go there, you have to bring your invitation. Now, you know what an invitation is? I'm going to give you a little, little card. I'm going to keep that one out. And these are blank, okay? So these don't have your name in them. You can open it up and look at it. And these are just like little invitation cards that you could use if you were inviting friends to a party or uh, you know, even like to come to, uh, to church with you or, or something. So look at the invitation card. But there's some places that you go that when you get to the door, they say, may I see your invitation? They want to make sure you were actually invited to be there. And if you weren't invited, they say, well, you don't belong here. But the kingdom of God's not like that. Jesus wants everybody to come and, and to know him and to spend forever with him. So these invitations say stuff like, for, meaning, you know, who is it? So, you, you know, if I gave this to you f to a party, it would have your name there. The date, when it is, the time, the place, all that information. Well, we know that Jesus invites us to come to him anytime. We can come to Jesus by praying to him. When we come to worship, that's another way that we come uh, and, and we feel Jesus' presence with us and we're with other people uh, as well. But then we know also that Jesus invites us to spend uh, eternity with him in, in heaven. So I just wanted you to know how much Jesus loves you and how much he wants you to, to come to know him and have that friendship with him and that you would trust him. But then also there's something else Jesus wants you to know. He wants you to know you can give that invitation to other people. That you can say, hey, you know, I know Jesus and he's very important to me. Uh, would you like to know him too? Or, you know, I go to church and I, I learn about Jesus there. Would you like to come? Or maybe we're having a special event or something. So you can always invite other people to, to meet Jesus as well. So let's have a prayer. Let's thank God for this invitation that we have to, uh, to get to know Jesus and to get to know him as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and you invite us to be a part of your family. Not just us who are sitting here not just because we're a certain age or anything like that. You invite everybody, that you want everyone to be a part of your family. And so, Lord, we come trusting Jesus and loving him, knowing that you sent your son into the world for us. And I pray that you would give us opportunities to invite other people to know Jesus as well. We pray in his name. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up with me. You can take that. You can actually have it. There you go. Okay. Uh, we all have people in our lives that, um, that, that typically move us towards the Lord. And, and with me, it was my granddaddy Jack and my grandmama Ruby. And my granddaddy, is, he's in heaven. My mom is still here, and she's struggling a bit, which is tough. It's tough for me to see. Um, when I was really little, whenever I was hungry, she'd say, you want some scrambled eggs? It doesn't matter what time of day it was. I'd say, yeah, I love scrambled eggs. 
And there was, there was something that in North Carolina they had, and there, this is the only family I've ever known to do this. So when I tell you, you're probably gonna go, ooh, gross, but let me tell you something that's good. <laughs> it's called cheese coffee toast. You ever heard of that? They would take sharp cheddar and you cut it up and then put instant coffee and they'd melt it in cheese and you put that on your toast and we would eat that by the loaf. And I loved staying with them. And at night, I would always walk by a room and the lights were out. And I could hear my granddaddy pray every night without fail. He was on one knee. And I heard him call me. And he taught me long, long ago that I need the Lord. And I'm so grateful for their witness. And I know you probably have somebody like that in your life. Now this is typically the part of the service where everybody remains seated. And that's absolutely fine. I have never been one to say, pop up, pop down. And I'm always careful to invite people. Because I know I don't want anybody to tell me what to do, right? <laughs> but this morning, if this song speaks to you, I just invite you to stand. And it's okay if you don't. Maybe the Lord's going to know you just sit here and you focus on me. But this song is so powerful. And it's a confession. Lord, I need you. When times are great, when times are bad, I need you to be in my life.
Last week, we, uh, we, we started a new sermon series talking about frequently missed opportunities. And so last week was kind of an introduction about why we tend to miss so many of the, uh, what I call divine opportunities that God lays before us. Uh, but then today and in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at more and more of specifics of what types of, of opportunities we sometimes miss. Um, so today we're talking about uh, the missed opportunity to welcome, or you might say the, the missed opportunity to be welcoming toward other people. You know, reflect with me j- j- uh, for a moment um, on a young couple long ago. She was quite far along in her pregnancy, her first pregnancy, when they were forced by a governmental decree uh, to go to another town for a taxation census. And maybe it was that they were, they were happy to leave where they were for a little while because it's possible there was some whispering in town from the busy bozzies who had been counting the months or uh, you know, the weeks and when the baby was going to be born, when did they have their wedding, that kind of thing. Now, there were rumors, I'm sure, around their hometown of, of miracles and angels the stories being told, but a lot of people just like to think the worst. So, anyhow, they make this what I'm sure was a rather arduous journey of about 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But when they get to Bethlehem, the place is pretty busy. A lot of census traffic is in the, in the area, and the Gospel of Luke tells us there was no room for them in the end. Seemingly, no one rolled out the welcome mat for this young couple. No one gave up their guest room or set them a place uh, at their table. There was certainly no maternity ward in town. And so we think that they probably camped out maybe at or around someone's uh, barn, and that's where they were when the baby kind of chose its inopportune time to be born. They ended up using a feeding trough as a crib. And of course, the the baby wouldn't remember all of these details. But the Bible tells us that his mother, whose name of course was Mary, was pretty good at treasuring things and pondering them in her heart. And so I'm pretty sure she later told her growing son about his rather humble entrance into the world. Now, about 30 years later, that little baby had grown up into a fine young man. He was trained as a carpenter, I'm sure by his father, who was a carpenter. But he always knew that wasn't his true calling. He had an amazing gift of spiritual insight, of preaching, of teaching, of even doing uh, miracles and healing people. He visited around at a number of area synagogues and then was finally invited to read the scripture passage in his own hometown then because they were back at Nazareth. According to Luke's gospel, here's what he chose to read from the uh, Old Testament prophet Isaiah, but this is from Luke chapter 4. It says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after reading that, he told the people, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, initially, many of the townspeople thought it was pretty cool that one of their own young people had grown up to be a gifted preacher. But then after reflecting on it, they questioned his training and his credentials. After all, who was he to be preaching to them? And so when the young preacher, who of course was named Jesus, he acknowledged that no prophet is accepted in his hometown and began to tell them that there were foreigners who were more spiritually receptive than they were. And that got them kind of hot. In fact, they were so offended, they tried to throw Jesus off a cliff. But he was able to walk away from them unharmed. 
And the Gospel of Matthew tells us he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. It must be pretty discouraging to be unwelcome in your own hometown. The Gospel of John really doesn't have what we call the nativity story of Jesus, but it says this in chapter 1. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Well, though Jesus was a gifted preacher and quite popular with the crowds, most places that he went, one group that never really cared for him were the, were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the other scribes and religious leaders. They were always questioning his authority and they were trying to, to trip him up to get him to say something wrong with trick questions. They were constantly criticizing him and his disciples. They didn't like that he healed people on the Sabbath day. They didn't like that he and his disciples didn't observe all of the ritualistic rules. And especially that Jesus would hang around with some of the riffraff of society. He would actually associate with people of, of questionable morals and, and uh, reputation. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners, they would ask. No, Jesus was not particularly welcome in their exclusive circles. I tell you this so that you will understand that Jesus knew what it was like to feel unwelcome. The Old Testament from Isaiah says this, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering and grief. He took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. In the New Testament, Hebrew says that as our high priest, Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses and our trials. Because we've all experienced what it's, been, what it's like to be excluded or unwelcome. Maybe from the playground when nobody picked you to be on their team. Or maybe when nobody invited you to sit with them in the, uh, the school cafeteria. Or maybe when you were ostracized at work for being the, the newbie. Or maybe when you went to church and nobody really talked to you. Now, most of us are you know, more or less middle-class white people, so we probably haven't experienced this as much as many, but we still understand the feeling, and so did Jesus. So during his ministry, Jesus made uh, the welcome of all people his priority, and to make sure that that universal nature of God's love and acceptance was well understood, Jesus went to great pains to point out those who were often not welcome in their own society that they would be welcome in the kingdom of God. So Jesus called special attention to those who were considered unimportant people, just not particularly high standing in society. You heard the story earlier uh, at the children's time when John Mason read it about how parents brought their children to Jesus. It's a good example of this. Um, in that case, we're told that it was the disciples who missed the opportunity to be welcoming to those children. The children, it seemed, were, were not yet at the age to be considered important enough to warrant Jesus' time and attention. Now, on one hand, we might cut the disciples a little bit of slack. They themselves had been raised in a society where children were to be seen and not heard. We still use that phrase. But on the other hand, hadn't they been listening to Jesus? You know, I've, I've read that story about Jesus and the children so many times. We often use it with baby dedications. And I really hadn't taken the time to back up a little bit, to look at the full context but if you go back into chapter 9, that was from Mark chapter 10. If you go into, in, into chapter 9, you find there's a section where the disciples are arguing among themselves who's the greatest in the, in the kingdom. They're, they're being very egotistical. So Jesus, rather gently, is trying to teach them to, to stop being so self-promoting, stop being so selfish. 
So he says to them, <coughs> if you want to be first, you need to put yourself last and become a servant. <coughs> and then Jesus did this. So this is Mark chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. It says, he took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. What a beautiful image of, of Jesus bringing forth, bringing forth a child and letting him sit on his lap and saying, you, you need to welcome this kind of people. Now, do you remember adults from your childhood? I, I do. There's some folks who stand out that were so, uh, so respectful, so attentive to me as a child, and they tended to be that way with other young people as well. They didn't ignore you. They didn't talk down to you, but they listened to what you have to, had to say like it was important, whether it was important or not. And they, uh, they treated you like, you like you really mattered. I think Jesus was that kind of person. Imagine how special that child felt when, when Jesus brought him forth uh, and, and talked about him. But then, within just a few verses later in that chapter, all this is happening in a fairly short period of, uh, of time, Jesus talks about children again. So you go down to verse 42 of, of chapter 9. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. Now that's a pretty bold and graphic warning about how important it is to nurture the faith of children. Well, then just a few verses later, you have the disciples turning these children away from Jesus. They just didn't get it. And I hope when Jesus rebuked them, the disciples, that they took, uh, they kind of took that to heart, that they watched Jesus hug and, and bless the little children, and they learned to value them. Now, there are other, certainly other uh, examples of potentially missing opportunities with people who are considered unimportant. Do you remember the story of the blind man named Bartimaeus? Uh, you can read about him later in that same chapter of, of Mark, chapter 10. As Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and he was leaving Jericho, uh, there's this blind man beside the road and he's doing the only thing he knows how to do for a living, he's begging. And as Jesus came by, I guess he recognized the name. He had heard the stories about him. And he started crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, the Bible tells us all the people around were telling him, be quiet. Stop, stop bothering the master. You see, people with handicaps, people with special needs, they were really just considered a burden on society. A passerby might toss a, a, a coin to the beggar, but they weren't important enough to deserve any real attention. But Jesus didn't feel that way, did he? Jesus took the time to talk to him, and then, of course, actually restored his sight. So it's important that we, we take a look at our own attitudes and prejudices and think, are there people that we consider too unimportant for our compassion or our hospitality. Now, if you have your bulletin, you see there's kind of a little outline of, of these, these points. Uh, I would encourage you, if someone pops into your mind that you think, you know, that, that's a person I really have been avoiding or ignoring, but they fall into this category, I need to be kind and welcoming to them. Jot their name down and then go back and look at your bulletin later. So we have those that were considered to be unimportant. Then there were also those that were considered unworthy. These are people that proper religious folks consider too tainted by the world for any kind of social interaction with them. As if, you know, somehow their immorality might rub off on us. But strangely, Jesus didn't feel that way. But let's be honest, for the rest of us, 
they are among the missed opportunities to welcome. Prime examples of of the ministry of Jesus were uh, to the tax collectors and the prostitutes. One group the tax collectors considered to be very unethical, and very often they were. The others, the prostitutes, considered to be very immoral, which, as a rule, they were. But somehow these sinners, as the Pharisees would call them, always seemed to be drawn to Jesus. I guess because he treated them like real people. The Pharisees and religious teachers didn't like that Jesus had chosen a tax collector, Matthew, to be one of his disciples. Or that he went and had lunch with Zacchaeus, the the tax collector, in in Jericho. And they didn't like that, that Jesus even allowed women of bad reputation to sit at a table with him and have conversation. They had no intention of offering any kind of welcome to people like that. But Jesus insisted that he came to seek and to save those who were lost. Jesus also called special attention to to people who were, we might just say, inconvenient. Do you remember the lady who had a a long uh, bleeding disorder? She'd had it for years and years and no doctor could, could ever cure her of it. And she heard that Jesus was coming through, and Jesus was in a hurry. He was actually going to to heal someone else who was about to die. So he had something he needed to do. But in the hustle and bustle of the crowd, this lady says, you know, if I can just touch his robe, maybe there'll be a miracle for me. Maybe some of his healing power will, will touch my body. And, of course, that's what she did. And she was not only healed by the power of Jesus, Jesus stopped, looked for her, and talked to her. He wanted her to know it wasn't just her physical healing that was important. He wanted her to know that she was not inconvenient to him. She was an important person who mattered. So if Jesus considered all these people to be worthy of a warm welcome, shouldn't we feel the same? Now, sure, sometimes being friendly and hospitable and welcoming, sometimes it comes so easy. It comes pretty natural when it's someone that we happen to like. It comes pretty natural if it's someone who is actually a lot like us. It comes pretty natural if it's someone who has something that they can offer to us. But being Christ-like goes beyond that. It's imperative that we stop missing the opportunity to welcome people just because they fall outside of our comfortable parameters. As followers of Jesus, instead of earning the reputation of being exclusive, judgmental, or even bigoted, we need to work on earning the reputation of being the kindest people in the community, the most generous the most forgiving, the most helpful, understanding, the most welcoming. Some of you know the name Chuck Swindoll. In one of his his books, he tells a story about uh, Thomas Jefferson. I never know these historical anecdotes, you know, how true they are. But the story was like this, that, that Jefferson had become president of the United States. Times were different back then, but, you know, of course, they traveled on horseback, and he was kind of making a a cross-country trip, and, and on doing that, uh, during that, um, there had been a downpour, they came to a river, the, the bridge had been washed out, and the only way to continue on the journey was to ford the river on their horses, uh, you kind of take their lives in their hands to, to do that, and, and so he had this, this, this party with him, this group of people, and, and several of the men on their horses made their way across the river, uh, they, were, they were scared, but, but they got across safely. And as this is happening, there's some fellow uh, on foot on the shore kind of watching this, this happen. And after he sees several people make it across successfully, he goes up to President Jefferson and asks him, you know, would you ferry me across the river on your horse? You know, would, you, would you carry me across with, with yourself? And the president agreed without any hesitation. The man climbed on, behind him on the horse, 
and shortly thereafter they had made it safely to the other side. And so as this stranger is getting off of the president's horse, uh, one of the other men in the party came up and said, why did you pick the president, you, you know, to, to ask to carry you across the river? And the guy was shocked. He said, oh, I didn't realize that, that that's the president. All I know is that some of your faces, on some of your faces was written, the answer is no. And on some of your faces is written, the answer is yes. And his was an is yes face. Our faces, our words, our body language it needs to make us the is yes people. Now, I want you to understand this about being a welcoming person. Welcoming does not mean that you give up your rights to set the parameters for the uh, relationship. You can't be all things to all people. God will give you the discernment and the wisdom to set the boundaries in a relationship, but I'm also going to tell you, it usually leans to the side of compassion. But you still are able to, to do that. Also, you need to know that being welcoming does not mean that you become best friends with everyone. That is just simply impossible. From time to time, someone's going to come into your relationship circle who will become a friend for life. And what a blessing that is. But at other times, it simply means a, a handshake or a smile is enough for that moment. Or that you take five minutes to, to listen to a problem that someone has and then you say a prayer for them. That may be all that's needed then. It may be that someone just needs to know that they are welcome in the family of God. So you scoot over in your seat so they have some room. That might be all that's needed. And then also, welcoming does not mean that you have to agree with or condone everything about that person that you're welcoming. Jesus was welcoming of tax collectors. But, you know, when he spent some time with Zacchaeus, Jesus knew that Zacchaeus was not okay the way he was. He had been cheating people. He was making enemies, and he, he didn't need to. But Jesus welcomed, in, welcomed him into his circle of friends so he could help him find a better way. Jesus was also concerned and kind and gentle with the woman caught in adultery. Do you remember that story? Instead of being harsh and judgmental toward her, he knew that this was a woman who was scared and struggling. And it earned him the right then to say to her, go and sin no more. He wasn't telling them that they were fine the way that they were. He was just saying, even though you're struggling, there's a place for you as my friend. Being welcoming doesn't mean you approve of everything about a person, but it does mean that you make it perfectly clear to them that you value a relationship with them, that they are worthy of your time and your attention and your compassion, and yes, even your acceptance as a child of God. As a church and as individuals, let's make a point to welcome others as Christ has welcomed us compassionately, unconditionally. That's how people are drawn to the Savior. Jesus will do the transformation work, not us. And though families, you know, can sometimes outgrow their house and have to get a bigger one, the kingdom of God is plenty big. The family of God is never going to grow, outgrow the kingdom. So let us be a welcoming people. Let's pray. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, we come admitting that there have been many times that we have missed the opportunity to welcome somebody in, to show them a kindness, to, to be a friend, to shake a hand, to say a word of encouragement, to give an invitation. 
But Lord, we know that we are taught that every person is important to you. And so every person needs to be important to us. I pray that you would make us a part of this this ministry of outreach, of, of reconciliation, this ministry of calling people to come into the family and meet the Lord. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have welcomed us that we know that we are important in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to sing together, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, one of my favorite hymns. And as we sing, take take a moment, just kind of look in your own heart and, and think of someone. And, and you know, you've got a week ahead of, uh, ahead of you before we meet again. So think of someone that maybe you should make contact with. Maybe you should invite them to come to church if they feel comfortable with that. Uh, um, Or maybe just that you would make a phone call and let them know that you're thinking of them. Um, But let the Lord speak to you and, and then keep that in mind and act on it this week. But then also if you have a decision that you want to share publicly about your faith in Christ or your relationship with the church, I'll be up here at the front while we're singing You're welcome to come and talk with me. Let's stand and sing.